So, for those of you who have not been outside with us or joined us on live stream before, what we've been doing the past several weeks, almost all of the summer and into the uh, school year really, is we have started this series called Doctrine, where each week we break down a fundamental belief that all of us as Christians are supposed to have. And each week we've seen how they all tie together, how each week it reveals a different uh, personality trait, a characteristic of God, and tonight and then again next week is basically what all of these beliefs we have come out of. Tonight we're talking about the cross, the crucifixion, and then just a little spoiler, next week we're talking about the resurrection. Everything we believe in this Bible comes out of these two events, the crucifixion and the resurrection, because without these two events, we don't have Christianity. We don't have Jesus being our Savior and Lord. Without Jesus dying on the cross, what we're going to talk about tonight, He doesn't pay for our sins. And without the resurrection, what we'll talk about next week, without Him coming back to life, He's not the Son of God. So these two weeks are probably the most important, the most fundamental beliefs that we as Christians have. We should all agree on these things because every bit of what we're going to be talking about comes straight from the Word of God. We're going to see how these really big words that we get that explain the doctrine, the beliefs we have, come directly out of Scripture. So talking about the cross, talking about the crucifixion, we see that God, the eternal God, the one who existed before time, when we talked about on week one, the creation, we talked about how God has just always existed. God was not created. He is the creator. He always was, he is, and he always will be. But on the cross, we see that God, in human form, Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, we see God dies, which should not happen. By any logical explanation that we can possibly come up with, God should not and cannot die. But he does. How? We're going to talk about that. So, to start off, the key Bible verse that relates to the crucifixion that we want to read tonight is Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8 says this, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That verse shows us the bulk of what we're going to be talking about. Why Jesus died, how he died, and how it impacts us. So why Jesus died? Let's talk about that for a minute. How does Jesus' death satisfy God's justice in wrath? We read about in several places in the Bible that the punishment for sin is death. We see that after Adam and Eve committed the first sin, we talked about the fall of man several weeks ago. After that first sin, the result of that is every single person that has been born since Adam and Eve is born naturally sinful people. They are born into this world and are automatically sinful, separated from God, evil by nature. The Bible tells us this. We see that God, in his characteristics, he hates sin. Because sin is missing the mark, missing the standard that he has set before us. We use the example of archery. Whenever you miss the target in archery, it's called a sin. That's literally what sin is, to miss the mark. So when we sin, every time that we sin, it should be a reminder, a trigger that reminds us of the fact that without Jesus, we are separated from God with no hope of being restored to him, brought back into his family. Without Jesus, it all falls apart. We talked a couple weeks ago about covenant. I think that was two weeks ago, the last time that I spoke to you guys, we talked about covenant. Covenants are the way that God makes promises to his people. And we read about several Old Testament covenants that God made with like Moses and Abram and David. We read about those covenants, but then we talked for a little bit about the new covenant. The covenant that was made when Jesus came, fully God, fully man, and lived a perfect life. He lived a life that we could never live, a sinless life. He never once sinned. He never once missed the mark that God set before him. And then at the end of his life, 
what we're talking about tonight. He died on the cross for us. And three days later, we know how the story goes. He rose again. But talking about the cross, talking about this new covenant sacrifice that is being made on the cross, we need to just refresh our minds of what the covenant is. Leviticus 17, verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by life. This book, this verse, comes out of the Old Testament thousands and thousands of years before Jesus ever comes down to earth. But just reading that verse in the context of the cross, you see a little bit of foreshadowing there, right? You see that God's giving us a hint at what was going to come through the person and work of Jesus. He says that he has laid his life down for us on the altar. He's given blood. What we need to understand about sacrifices, talking about the new covenant sacrifice, Sacrifices require the spilling of blood. In the New Testament, you read several stories about the people of Israel, God's people, making sacrifices where they would kill a very specific kind of animal for certain sins. They would spill the blood over the altar. And that was a way to temporarily appease God, to appease His wrath. And God recognized the sacrifices that His people made to Him. So long as their hearts were in the right place, he recognized the sacrifices and he didn't punish his people for their sins. He had mercy on them because of the sacrifice. So reading this verse out of Leviticus, in the New Testament context, Jesus is the sacrifice for us. When he dies on the cross, Jesus is that goat or that lamb that is warding off God's wrath that is sparing us from God's judgment. The judgment that demands the blood be spilled, that death be the result of sin. Through Jesus' death, He covers our sins. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. You were ransomed from the futile ways and inherited from your forefathers. My forefathers being Adam and Eve, the ones that caused all of these sins to enter the world. Peter says, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, those didn't save us, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. So in the Old Testament, when they had to sacrifice a lamb, they would get the clean and pure lamb that was without any blemish or spot on its coat. Oftentimes you see that the lamb used is innocent in every way. Jesus is that lamb for us. He's perfect and he's pure without blemish or spot or sin. Jesus is that lamb, that sacrifice for us. Then we get to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 verses 23, 24, and 25 is where a lot of the doctrine, the beliefs that we have about the crucifixion come from. Because these verses sum up the entire message of the gospel. Starting in verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the former sins. So out of these three verses is what we're going to spend the next several minutes talking about, breaking down some really big words that were in those verses where we get this doctrine from the cross. So in those three verses, there's some really big words. Those big words are justification, redemption, and propitiation. And what on earth do those words mean? So justification essentially boiling it down into like language we use today is to be made right by someone. Someone that you have offended essentially forgives you of that offense. You're made right in their eyes. So putting it in the context that's being used here in Romans, justification, when it says that we are justified by His grace as a gift, God has made us right in His eyes. Romans tells us that he did this by his grace as a gift. 
Other places in the Bible say that we've been saved by faith through grace so that no one may boast. Because there's no way that you and I can ever save ourselves. The only way that we can be saved is through believing in Jesus Christ. Believing that what he did on the cross saved you from your sins, because it did. And believing that three days later when he rose again, he conquered sin, Satan, death, and the grave so that we wouldn't have to. When Jesus rises from the grave three days later, what Tyler will talk about next week, when Jesus comes back to life, that secures our salvation. That, along with the crucifixion, justifies us. It makes us right in God's eyes. Then Romans says, We've been justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So what is redemption? The root word in redemption is to redeem. Redeeming someone or something. So in context of the Bible, redemption is being free from our bondage and slavery to sin. Jesus on the cross broke the chains that held us back. The chains that kept us enslaved to sin. We still struggle with sin even after we believe in Jesus, but only for a temporary time. And so long as you believe in Him, at the end of your life, when you pass away, you step in to the other side of eternity, when you're face to face with God, you'll have to answer for the sins that you've made. But God will forgive you of your sins because He will see the blood of Jesus that is spilled for you, just like He did in the Old Testament with the sacrifices of the lamb and the goat. The next thought out of these verses in Romans says, For through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward into propitiation by His blood. Propitiation is a very hard word to pronounce. It's a very big word that some may think is difficult to understand, but propitiation simply means this. To appease God's wrath by offering something or someone, specifically, of eternal value, to cover the debt that our sin has made. Propitiation is like a substitute when you trade something of equal value. So let's say that I owed Brady 20 bucks. I was in debt to him by $20. I couldn't hand you $15 and my debt be paid. That's not a good substitute. I'm not paying off that debt. It doesn't cover the debt or the weight that has been put on my shoulders, on my life. So those sacrifices in the Old Testament, God recognized them as a temporary fix to the eternal problem that is sin. He temporarily forgave the people of their sins. He didn't punish them in that moment for their sins. He would be completely justified to wipe us off the face of the earth at any given moment because we by nature are sinful people. But instead, He chooses to have mercy on us not do that. He has mercy on us and chooses to temporarily back off and not extend the full weight of his wrath on us. And we see the reason he does this is because Jesus is our substitute. Jesus is the only one who could save us, who could pay off that debt in full. And the reason that Jesus is the only one that could do that because he is fully God, fully man. 100% God, 100% man. The way the math works. 100% God. Only God could bypass or pay the debt that satisfied God's wrath. Jesus being 100% God satisfied the wrath of God. And then Jesus being 100% man, punishment of sin is death. The way Sin is death. What we just read about in Leviticus is that the atonement of sacrifices it requires the spill of blood. So Jesus being 100% man, dying on the cross, spilling his blood for us, makes that sacrifice whole. That is how Jesus saves us. That's how it adds up. Because any other possible combination to that problem does not add up. Anyone other than Jesus falls short in some way. We're not 100% God. And even us being human, we're still flawed because of sin. 
we cannot save ourselves. Jesus can, and he did. So that's what propitiation means. Jesus was that perfect substitute, the perfect sacrifice that stood in our place, stepped between us and the wrath of God, and said, I'll take that debt on myself. I'll pay their debt. And when he died on the cross, he experienced for the first time in eternity separation from God because the wrath of God, all of our sin was poured out on him. Jesus died to save us for our sins. But who did he die for? A lot of us very quickly will recite John 3.16. Me and Tyler were talking about this earlier today. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's a very simple Bible verse that sums up the entire message of the gospel. The most well-known verse in the entire Bible because of that. But when we're asking the question, who did Jesus die for, we first need to understand the situation. The situation that is what we've talked about these past weeks that have led up to the cross. One, we're all born guilty. By our nature, we are sinners because of an Adam and Eve original sin. We are all born in need of saving. From the moment that we are alive, we are separated from God and we are spiritually dead. Second, Jesus died to provide the payment of sins for all people. But this only applies to you if you believe in Him. Jesus dying on the cross does not apply to the atheists of the world or the people that don't believe that Jesus was who He said He was. You name off every other world religion except Christianity. These people do not have the payment for their sins applied over them. The blood of Jesus does not wash them clean because they do not believe. We mentioned the verse earlier, you can say by grace through faith. By having faith, by believing, you have been saved. The blood of Jesus applies to those who believe in him. And then third, God desires for everyone to be saved. The Bible tells us that God's wish is that all may be saved. But the truth is, not everyone is going to be. There are those people in the world whose hearts are so hardened and cold and dead. We read about several people in the Bible like that. Their hearts are so hardened towards God that they refuse to believe in Him. And therefore, they spend the rest of eternity separated from God in hell. They do not get to experience the saving grace that has been given to us through Jesus. And because of that, they spend forever being punished for their sins. So God desires for everyone to be saved, but not everyone will be. People die every day that are not saved. The atonement found in Jesus and His death on the cross is only applied to us as Christians. When you give your life over to Christ, when you accept Him as your Savior and Lord, you are covered by His blood. And all of this doctrine of the cross can be summed up in one word called atonement. The atonement. The atonement was Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Jesus atoned for our sins. He paid the price and took our debt on Himself so that we wouldn't have to pay that price. Jesus dying on the cross paid the ultimate price. He did not have to die for any one of us. But He did because He loved us. Romans 5 eight again. I'm going to read it and we'll wrap down for tonight. Romans 5 eight. God shows His love for us. And then while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ chose to die for us because He loves us. The whole reason the cross exists is because of God's love. And in the end, for His glory. Jesus died on the cross because He loved us. 
but it doesn't stop there. Because of the cross, we are supposed to worship and glorify God and thank Him every day for the breath that we have in our lungs and for the chance to share the gospel with the people around us. That's what the doctrine of the cross is. The fact that we have been saved when we did not deserve it. That's what we are supposed to believe when it comes to the cross. Jesus didn't have to die for us, but He chose to. So wrapping up tonight, I've got one question that I wanted to leave y'all with. And then on those papers Olivia gave you, you've got like three or four questions on the back. Those are your homework questions. But as we play kickball tonight, as you go back home, I want you to think about this question. What does the doctrine of the cross reveal about God's love? We read Romans 5a. The cross exists because God loves us. But take it deeper than that. What does it reveal about God's love? Because God's love is something so much greater than the love that we know. We can't fully comprehend the love that God has for us. So as you go home throughout this week, look at those questions. Please do your homework. And then come back next week as Tyler talks about the resurrection. Let's pray. God, we just want to... First and foremost, thank you for the cross. God, it's very odd for us to thank you for the thing that killed our Savior, but without it, he would not be the Savior we needed, God. Without his death on the cross, we wouldn't have the chance to be here tonight, to read your word, to learn about these fundamental beliefs, and learn more about you, ultimately, God. We want to thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. God, we want to thank you for the way that you have provided for us these past few months. The fact that we are standing here today is a gift from you. God, we just ask that you continue to be with us each and every day. And that you continue to encourage and empower us to share this message with the people around us. Because the truth is that there are so many people around us who do not believe in this message that we've talked about tonight, God. We pray that you would give us opportunities to share this with them and that they would believe so that they could be covered by your son's blood. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen.